Welcome to the podcast. I'm joined by full-time investor, equity analyst, all-round spreadsheet super guy, Paul Hill. You all right, fella? Yeah, morning, Justin. I've definitely been bashing a few spreadsheets this week. But before I sort of go into that, you were hanging... <laughs> hey, how often, how often do you bash a spreadsheet? How often do you open a spreadsheet? Do you do it every day? Is that the first thing you do? Or what do you do? What's the first... In the morning, your morning routine, because this always fascinates me. When you get up, what do you look at? I mean, most people, the first thing they pick up is their phone and look at that. Uh, but you know, when you actually, financially, what do you look at first of all? Well, it depends on what time I wake up. Like last night, it was about quarter to 12. So I turned on Bloomberg and got the late, the late closing prices. And so you saw quarter to midnight you woke up. Yeah, well, sometimes, you to... sometimes I don't sleep very well. <laughs> what time do you go to bed? Uh, well, last night was about eight o'clock. I was hoping to sleep a bit longer, but I just couldn't get to bed. So, and then, I had a problem then... Thursday, yeah, uh, go on. It, and then it sort of like all changed. So I usually sort of like watch a bit of, well, just sort of catch up on the news, see what's happening. It usually is nothing, nothing really of note. And then after sort of bashing, whether it's a research report or whether it's basically doing some modelling or whether it's reading up what, what's been happening in terms of stocks and, and sectors and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's a fascinating way I hold my life. How, how, long, how long is it until you open up a spreadsheet? How long does spreadsheet? I know I usually I usually have my spreadsheet out all the time. <laughs> yeah, I, see. I usually go to sleep with it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, regardless of my, of my spreadsheet, you have me sort of like in suspense and the rest of us sort of like hanging on a thread two weeks ago when you were saying, oh, I'm going to pull the trigger on this FinCap stock. And apparently it's true, Fin. I've never even yeah. heard of it before. But I, no, no, about no. It. What, how much no, money no. Is well, i tell you how I heard about it. The, 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 uh, the guy... The IR guy, you know, this is a PR guy for financial PR, um, behind escapement, just got into contact with me. He said, there may be an interesting thing here. Have a look at it. He said, we haven't done any publicity on it because there's a reason for it. There's a fund who holds 75% of it. It's closed and they want to get rid of the stock. And so they placed now about uh, what, 50% of that. They've got about 20% left. But it's very interesting because it's in a very hot area. Let me just share the screen with you, right? Uh, and um, I looked at their results. First of all, you look at their results, right? And they are going to make a loss historically, of course, but their revenue doubled, right, to 14.6 million. And that was largely down to they own four companies. One is PlayStack, which is a gaming company and a fund as well. The others are basically fintech companies. Uh, but PlayStack went gangbusters last year because one of their games, and they've got many games, let's go through this. Many of their games is, uh, so these are the four companies, but many of the games is Oxygen, there's Virtus, there's Targo. In fact, Targo I talked to you about, they've just done a deal with Lloyds, uh, a trial six months. Oh, and yeah, they that's do, what you remember. Do, yeah, that's what yeah, you're saying, do, wasn't it? Yeah, okay. Yeah. They do um, invoice of small, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, invoice uh, management software. So basically, and they've shown that, uh, and I'll show you this slide, but they, they do a six months trial with them. But if you read the, the update with Lloyds, the guy from Lloyds doesn't sound like it's a trial. It sounds like it's a done deal. We'll know by June whether it's a full-on deal going ahead. Mm. I think it will be because they're plugged into it and it's pretty much it. But Playstack, Mortal Shell was a hit they just had and it's gone pretty much global. And this is the hardest thing about games. They've got loads of games, but the hardest thing about getting a big hit in the game is, is getting that traction, first of all, the big hit. Once you get that, and you do the sequel. And it's not like, I like films, you know, the sequels don't flop because you get more, you've got an installed fan base then. You know, initially just you don't a, have a fan just base. A, just a, just a, my understanding that it's a fintech company that has developed yeah. a, a game. No, they didn't develop it. They basically bought this company out. It's called Playstack, who, and I'll go through. So this is Playstack, right? It's four bits to it. It's a publishing uh, company. It's a award development fund, award-winning. But these are all the games they do. So this is one part. They own this, they own Playstack 100%. And uh, the same thing happened with Targo. In fact, my membership group, oddly, is a guy in there who came in the webinar on, on Wednesday. He talked about Targo. His brother used to own Targo, and he just didn't have the cash to keep going. So but he's so going just, gangbusters. Just, 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 just yeah. rewind. Two weeks ago, you gave me a kicking for owning Northbridge Industrial because it had two separate businesses. And you're, yeah, saying, not, uh, yeah, you're, yeah, yeah. you're saying this is a fintech business and the gaming business, which frankly have no synergies at all between each other. Of course other. they do. It's tech. It's, no, it's, 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 it's fast. <laughs> It's fast growing. They double the revenue in a year. Listen, it's yeah, tech, yeah, it's no, no, I understand look, that. Look at that, doctor. But no, listen. What I'm saying is, if you read the last update, they are disposing of several, probably two, maybe even three parts of the business because uh, they've done this before. They did hold. I don't know if you ever heard a distribution finance DCF. Uh, have you ever heard of that company? There's a, a startup bank. They spun that off, return yeah, money okay. to shareholders. So they do this quite often. And so I said to James, the CEO, I said, listen, the problem you've got here is you've got four stories going on in once. And even though three of them are quite exciting, 
private investors, you know, can't get their head around all that. You need a simple story, but they are going to be streamlining this. And they did mention in the last update, they're looking to sell to them at least maybe three. Um, but yeah, this, this, this game has gone gangbusters anyway. And it's really given that, you know, the cash flow of the business, but Epic Games, of course, publishers of Fortnite. So deal with basically, them. they're a gaming company with some fintech businesses, and they want no, no, to no. Start. The last, BlazeTech was the last thing they, they acquired. So the, they were a fintech. They did something else, but they were a fintech, and they brought this on. I don't know what happened. I think it was a, some kind of deal went on there. But it turns out to be another star of the portfolio, and uh, it's growing very quickly. Um, but what I like, let me, let me go to the Volsa. Yeah, this is, no, um, I agree. Yeah, this yeah. is integrated um, gaming software. This is, this is, this is advertising within. This is a bit like you know Bidstack. This is what Bidstack have. They have hit games and they yeah. have this, which is like um, you know uh, dynamic advertising within the games. Uh, but this is Stargo, right? And uh, this is the website. But if you look at this, seventy percent reduction in unpaid invoices over a month after using Stargo software. So they've done, it's a, Lloyd's views as a white label. Okay, so this is the growth organically, but now. This has gone berserk because commercial pilot with Lloyd's uh, expected to lead to a five-year commercial agreement. And they say this is expected to have material positive impact on the financial expectations of Stargo. And um, if you look at Ben Stevenson, he's the MD and head of invoice financing at, at Lloyd's Bank. He just says, I'm delighted to partner with Stargo in order to rapidly launch the best-in-class digital working capital solution for our clients. The proposition will help deliver critical funding and digital tools to small businesses in the UK. I didn't realize how big Lloyd's were compared to every other bank. In the UK, I mean, I look at the market share. Mark, they're, look at that. I mean, I can't see that from the other way, but they're over um, 20 odd percent. The next one down is, is Barclays, 15. So you can see that, you know, it's going to have a massive impact. Now, there's, there's other parts. There's like auction finance. This is the market leader. Justin, right? Justin, just Justin, oh. Justin, just before we yeah. move on from to Chicago, what will happen there, in my view, okay, is if that pilot works. Yeah. Lloyd's will buy that business. That's what I thought. I thought, why wouldn't yeah. they buy it? I know. That's what I, that's what I said. So they're already, anyway, they're already thinking of selling Oxygen and Virtus Hill too. But if the target sold to Lloyd's, it'll just be placed at them, the gaming company, you know? Yeah. So, um, but Oxygen is another part of the, this is an early payment system between uh, public governments, government bodies, and, uh, you know, people who supply services to them. They are the biggest. They are the market leader in this. They've got recurring revenue, five-year contracts, 94% client retention, 90% uh, contracted revenue uh, going forward. Now, all these companies are at sort of, um, you know, inflection points of going to cash flow positive. They're all mm -hmm. now starting to get EBITDA positive. So it's, and got, if you look at it, they're valued about 65 million, the company altogether, um, Truefin, 15 million in cash. So each of these companies, they, you know, if you're going to split them equally, not more than a 10 million quid each, you know? And um, so I just think then quite a few areas here, like I said, EBITDA profitability, this is for um, oxygen and uh, oxygen dominance continues. Uh, this is Virtus, another part of the company, it's a bit boring, but it's independent. In fact, you'd quite like this. We're able to um, enable ownership succession between the independently minded financial advice firms in the UK. They make it possible for owners to sell their business to like-minded firms. So another bit of uh, financial tech there. They're not what's its what's I mean, its you outside of gaming? What's its unique USP? Who? Out of, what what is what is um, true fins in the fintech side? The three businesses. What its what is its USP? Well, um, well, it's USP. I suppose. Is there any other company like that with uh, four bits? Is that small? That many cash? And market leaders in their fields, and yet you know they're going to profitability now on all things. I just think it's undervalued company. And uh, and Playstack, for example, you know, um, that's going to be a massive hit. Mortal Shell Two will be a big hit, uh, bigger than yeah, Mortal Shell yeah. One, uh, because you've got that million people fan base already now installed. Um, I don't know. I quite like. I liked Bidstack's tech be before, but they've got. Been stacked times ten with it because they've got a, a, a portfolio of games already mm. and publishers, and they've got a, a fund there that they fund future um, um, games makers and games writers. Um, so I don't know what's going to happen. With this I'm very interested. Uh, now Aragrass is the fund, right? Well, look at this. This is James, is the CEO. But Aragrass, I don't know if you've um, noticed the fund. Aragrass, there they held seventy three percent of the company, right? Yeah. They've sold down fifty three percent. Forty. They've placed it by say forty five pence. Uh, but I tell you this interesting holy. I don't know if you've ever heard of this. Have you ever heard of uh, Watrium? They are from Norway. They're a big family office, right? These are the guys there. They're basically the family office of the Caribbean cruise liner. And they, they hold companies for generations. They own 21% of the company. Yeah. And so the shareholders' base is very stable. But um, 
And if you look at um, the other the buyers, who was Jay, Jay Hambro, Lombard, Gresham House. Yeah, all they're all they're all smart cookies. Those guys. Yeah. So they all took that place in stock at forty five pence from Aragrass. Aragrass got twenty percent left, got nineteen point nine percent. So I don't know what where this is going to go, but I just think there's very many exciting parts of the business. Probably the most exciting is, is like you know Playstack and Satago. Um, the deal with Lloyd's is very exciting, and Mortshell Two is very exciting. So I don't know where it's going to go, but I, they won't have four companies. You know, in about a year mm. or two's time, it'll be one player and plenty of cash. And they've done it before. They've returned cash to shareholders, you know, when they've uh, sold businesses. Like DCF Finance is called a distribution finance. That was a bank at the start of banks. Sort of, um, they spun that off and they loaned them to the nine million and that's been returned uh, to shareholders. Last question yeah. then, Justin. Yeah. How much is the stock worth? Do you know, it's hard at the moment because I want to see, you know, um, they're going to have results out soon in April. But again, you, know, you, know, you know what I'm going to say next? Yeah. You need, you, sure. need, you need spreadsheet itis like me. Yeah. Get all those spreadsheets, mate. I'm going to say it's a five bagger at least. <laughs> I'll, I'll hold you to that in two years' time, okay? No, yeah, I mean, but, I, but, but what I think is going to happen, no, what I think is going to happen is, is the money will be returned to uh, shareholders and then the structure will become a lot more simple because at the moment you've got these four parts of the business. Um, it'll become a lot more simple. Maybe they'll have two parts, maybe one part, you know, because, um, yeah, I agree. Do you know what? I was just in the shower just then thinking about Chicago. And I thought, do you know what's likely to happen to that? Is Lloyd just buy it? <laughs> yeah, they Lloyd? will. You know, if, yeah. if that works, they'll buy it. They'll bring it in-house, yeah. no doubt about it. I, I think it's a really interesting um, unbundling opportunity, you know, realising, you know, value, no doubt about it. Yeah, and uh, in fact, let's just put a look at the, um, look at the chart. It's, it's, starting, it's, it's quite nicely starting to build here. It's seen, so this is the placing area. Where is it? Uh, 45 pence from right here. And it's, it's slowly creeping up. It's a nice trend here. All these lines, which are moving averages, are moving upwards in the right direction. So, yeah, it's, I think it's an exciting year ahead for them because they haven't shouted about it because they've had this overhang of stock. And they said, there's no point in doing that because every time yeah. the share price rises, they made that jump stock. But I think they're going to place the next 20%, hopefully, again, at a higher level. That's why Aragraph didn't sell it all because they realized they could probably sell a bit more higher up. So, um, so yeah, but... Um, it's, I, I just like it. It's the options they got there. You know? Yeah, but in contrast, they, in the last two weeks, I've bought a really, really exciting large cap pharma company what, called what AstraZeneca. <laughs> have you bought them, you? Yeah, okay. no, I mean, I just, I basically just finished off my portfolio. I've got a baker's dozen now. I've got sort of 12 stocks plus my house, which gives them a baker's dozen, and I've got very little cash. So I just utilized all my sort of like another four or five percent of, uh, of cash. And I mean, basically, it had been sold off and still is due to the vaccine news. And um, I mean, the, the, the pipeline for AstraZeneca is absolutely fabulous in, in oncology or, or you know, um, immuno oncology mm. and also in sort of like cardiovascular, respiratory immunology and all kinds of stuff. And it's just I mean, I, I looking at they're going to do five dollars per share this year. And if you put that into the sort of like your inch your spreadsheet, you get sort of like a 19, 20 times PE ratio, given the current share price. But this this is going to grow EPS by 20% over the next three or four years easily and probably over the next decade. And on that basis, it's got a peg ratio of about one, which is basically fair value. And it's and these are mostly new new, new drugs it's got on, on Immuno. So I think it will hit $8 per share in 2023 in EPS. You put it, you put a, a sort of like a market multiple or keep it the peg ratio, you get a, you get a share price of around about $160 on a 20 times, which would be a peg ratio of one. And you basically then put that back on the exchange rate, you get sort of £115 per share compared to a £71 per share current price. And for a big cap, which is largely probably in the top three in the FTSE, plus a three two and a half percent dividend yield. I mean, it was a no brainer for somebody like me. I mean, it's not. Like, be... Do you know what? It's like talking to a calculator. Oh, hey, oh, you know, I'm a number. <laughs> I'm a numbers man. I'm a numbers no. man. Do you know? I, I'm looking at the chart there. It's funny, isn't it? That they've dipped literally, nearly. Look at that. It's, it's a joke. Eight. It's a gift. If you're a big yeah, yeah. cap, if you're a big cap, you know, investor. And I, we talked about this in detail last last two weeks ago. You go for the best in class technology. These guys in immuno oncology, along with with Merck. Are by and probably Bristol Mars are not a pretty damn good and Roche, but those are by far and away the top four oncology companies. And it's going to be a golden era of medicine yeah. going forward because. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so, what, so what are you expecting? What return then are you hoping to get over the, for that over the next in you know, a few years there? 
I, I think gross return, you can get basically high, you can get high teens on this. 15 to 20% is certainly not unreasonable. I mean, as I say, if you work out £115 per share is a normal value, a fair value for the stock in three years, that's 60%, 50, 60% return on its current level. Plus, you get a 2.5% dividend yield. The maths works out, 15 20% per annum return. I mean, that's a, it seems like a no-brainer for a, for a big market cap. And they just bought Alexion, which will be accretive to, the, you know, to, to EPS in a couple of years' time. I mean, I, I just thought it was a gift, so I just took it, basically. Yeah. I just thought, Do you see you know, what's, happening, uh, what's happening recently with the, uh, the, the, the politics in Europe? I think that's criminal, almost criminal, the way they've you know, sort of talked about AstraZeneca. And then all of a sudden, we get these figures come up from America. Phenomenal figures of, yeah. of, of you know, one hundred percent of re- reducing sort of severe you know, illness, yeah. and uh, it was and it, you know you got Macron playing the politics because Sanofi failed pretty much, and yeah. it, the, they were also we don't want AstraZeneca. Now they're saying give us AstraZeneca. It's like they're, oh, really, they're panicking. It's like I, I know it's, it's it's ridiculous what they've done there. It's, it's all about big bureaucratic, you know, a body lumbering body that can't move, which is lumbering around doesn't know what to do, you know, well, I- and. Yeah, I think the populace in the EU are just flabbergasted by the incompetence of mm-hmm. what's been happening, and now they're putting export bans. Essentially, they're not in not in the, in those words, but they're effectively saying we're not we're not they're not export bans, but we're not going to export anything because we're going to use it ourselves. The problem yeah. is, is that they've they've muddied the water so much that the actual electorate now don't want to use it. I mean, it's yeah, absolutely. Yeah. But anyway, regardless, it means it's a gift. In my view, for if you if you want a large cap pharma company, and I was looking for one, then that's a gift to me. If you've got prepared to hold that three to five years, you'll make 15, 20 percent. And, 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 and frankly, I'll take that any day for this type of quality business with unbelievably good technology, you know, and science. So. That was a that bit could, of- do, you know, do you know what I found that if, if you look at the, I mean, I, I keep mentioning the chart here. By the way, if, if you're listening on podcasts, you can look at this on video to the chart on the screen. Um, the thing is, uh, as, as you know, you know, you know, your moral figures man and technical man, of course, I look at a bit of both. Um, like they are, they bounced not far from that, that March dash for cash crash. Mm. We all saw they went down to, they spiked down like 61 there dollars and they punched back up to sort of towards 96. And but they've been rolling over now. Now they're below the moving average, 200 day moving average. That's two, that's the red one there. That's seen as the bull bear line essentially, you know, the trend. The trouble with these um, big stocks, they can stay grind low for a while, can't they? What do you, I mean, have you put everything in or do you scale, do you scale in or not? They pay a dividend. What's the dividend? No, they don't pay a dividend. Scaling. Well, that isn't even my lexicon, Justin. I just dump some money straight into it. That's what I do. <laughs> and you don't mind if it grinds low for another year or so? Hey, that's part and parcel of what I do. You know, you can never buy at the bottom. You can never sell at the top. You just try and make a profit in between and get a nice dividend if you can. This seems, this is, a, in my view, if you're looking for a gift of a large cap at these current levels and you just want a good steady return over the long period, hey, Astra fits the bill. It's just a... It's a it's it's been sold off because of these you know problems with sort of the you know coronavirus and also fears that you know basically they're not going to manufacture enough and they're going to you know but anyway and also because you know part of the whole sort of like last year is that a lot of their patients haven't been able to be treated because of the, you know cancer screening and cancer treatment and all that that's all coming through you're going to get a golden period of medicine on top of you know sort of like. Uh, you know, all this pent up demand, which, which will happen when it will come through. I mean, I, 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 the, the, the last time Astra sort of went into a downtrend like this, like, like this currently was in 2015. And it sort of it crossed over that 200 day moving average in June, uh, April, June 2015, managed to get back above it uh, a year later. Um, so it, it may take a little bit because these juggernauts have stopped. Anyway, moving on. Have you, what else have you done with your portfolio this last two weeks? You've been selling anything or buying anything more? No, I've I've been sold any, well, I've sold a little bit because I've, I've got very little cash and I've been buying something else. I'm not going to tell you yet. Because oh, you know, not this you know, again! Not you know, this you know, like cat no, and whenever, mouse. No, no. Whenever I talk about a stock, right, I like the share price to be in the right position. I don't like any spikes that happened. And, and a stock I sort of bought a little bit of, not a lot and not enough, just spiked um, and and it annoyed me. Oh, and so. Um, it's, it's, and I, whenever I talk about stocks, and even when I share a video on stock, I hope the the chart is is okay. It's not spiked out or anything. You know, it's it's in a reasonable level where you can say, okay, I can start getting into that. Anyone can start getting in after doing research. So I'm going to wait for this stock to calm down. I want one bit more information, but I like it. It's in a hot area. It's a it's a micro cap, and uh, I was looking at just 
you know, all my previous decent winners, and they've all come from micro caps. You know, I'm talking sub 10, sub 20 million market Which cap. part of the micro cap? Where is it? Technology, gaming? It's a uh, sustainable, renewable, sort of really hot area. Before we went into pandemic, there's one theme that's everyone was talking about, and I'm not going to say anything else. Don't you even guess? I'm not going to say yes or no. But and then all of a sudden, it, that moved aside for the pandemic, and we've heard very little about that kind of worry we had. Uh, but it's in that area, you know. But okay. um, and when you're going and when you're going to spill the beans on it, a couple of weeks time. I don't know. I, I, you can see my portfolio here. Look, uh, it's track wise up. Track wise had a fall down bounce uh, today. What happened yesterday? Do you know what happened yesterday in the small cap arena? It it's, been, me... it's been rolling over a lot. The Russell two thousand in the states yeah. has rolled over big time. It's basically what it is. People just de-risking. That's all it is, and it's largely the algos. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what? It reminded me. I don't remember a couple of years back, a, a broker, a London broker went through, a small cap broker went through, and uh, all of a sudden everything sold off they had and it, it, liquidity issues happened. It reminded me of that yesterday. So it was really odd. It's like, if you look at the main industry, I mean, all industries are down, but AIM was down the worst. Like, the, the big industries were down like half of 1%, and AIM was down like 1.4% pretty much. And I think, well, what's going on there? And um, every one of my stocks was red. And when you get a day like that, you know, psychologically, it can be quite hard if you're a new person as well. And you're sitting there and every, not just one or two, but every one of your stocks is red and it's just different degrees of, of loss, you know? And you think, wow, psychologically, that's very hard sometimes. And you can see why, you know, the, even the, the pain of a stock going down is twice as hard as the pleasure that you feel of the stock going up, you know? But again, we all know we've been here before. We've been in some of the worst sell-offs ever and it's always sort of rebounds, doesn't it? And that's psychological thing. Is it, is it the thing people have to get over and not sell because some of the big bounce days are the days after that big sell day, you know? So if you sell on a down day, you're going to miss that bounce, you know? So mm. it, that old saying, time in the market, isn't it? It's, it's better than trying to time the market all the time because uh, I've missed out on several times. Okay, mate, right. Get, get, your, get your charting boots on. What about... Viva and Lloyd, because they can't, Viva's come out with some blockbuster yeah. uh, sales let's go, today let's go Viva, of its then. Polish business. And you gave me so much grief, 18, about nine months let's ago. Oh, that's good. Look at that. So you gave me, to, you gave me moving so average, much then. grief about nine months ago for buying them. And uh, they're coming back strong. And, and, and Aviva, I'll just give you an update on Aviva, because I'm obviously having a shed, uh, quite a bit of it. I mean, they've sold, they've, they've restructured the business. They've sold eight entities overseas. The CEO, who's a superwoman and done a terrific job, Amanda Blanc, has just sold the last one, which is the, uh, the Polish business, for a, a real absolute knockout price of two and a half billion euros to Allianz and a fabulous sort of premium at sort of like five point, I think it was 5.7 times uh, book. And what it means is that it adds another 10% to net tangible assets. And, and frankly, this is tracking up because people are starting to realize that this has got significant upside and it's a fairly low risk business. And the same is about Lloyd's as well, because, you know, it, it, it's got all these provisions it's going to release. And now that it can release Sartago's results, the Sargo software as well, I mean, that's going to really spike the shares, you know? So, I mean, when, you know, it came down to, to being selling off and, and, and the economy is not as bad because we've, we've had that reopen on the, uh, uh, you know, on the vaccine side. So I'm still very positive about both. And there was good news as well from the US banks because we saw, you know, the, this movie and the Fed has decided that it's going to allow the big US banks to pay dividends and to make share buybacks. You can just see that happening mid-year in the UK. And once you get that, then investors are going to, you know, return to the dividend plays and it's going to migrate to net tangible assets on Lloyd's of about 50, 55p. And you can see the similar sort of thing for Aviva, which is, I mean, essentially their net, their net assets, if you put it at the end of this year, is £5.80. Never mind the current share price is four quid. So there's still a lot of flipping puff left in these, in these stocks. And as you mm. say, the, the, what do you think of the charts? Well, as I was going to say, you know, that sticks out to me. Well, I talked about the 200-day moving average. If you if you look at any any moving average, look at that. Look at this here. Do you remember this? What this day is? Have a guess what this day is. We've punched up a massive volume day, so big volume, okay, and then it a big Back move. Vaccine day. That was 9.73 percent up for Aviva, a big stock, of course. That's a big jump. And that was vaccine day, yeah. And it yeah. just went straight to the 200-day moving average there, and that you know that marks technically people say uptrend there. So that's that's good. And all these moving averages in the right position now. They're all going up. So that's very nice, isn't it? Where would you, I mean, where would you see a resistance point? Maybe back towards that level over here, resistance, but it may go. Well, I mean, it, I would say if people were thinking of own it like I do, and then you're looking to sell. 
then don't sell at the moment. I mean, I, I would only consider selling Lloyd's at round about o over 50p. 50p would be by far and away the earliest. And That's likewise, with a Viva, I wouldn't sell a Viva until it gets to nearly five quid because there's plenty of upside still to go on these and uh, it's tracking yeah. well. And I mean, frankly, they're, they're unbundling. And, it, and, and one benefit of the pandemic is that they're shedding costs like anything. And did you see yesterday's announcement from, um, well, there's two really, from Santander closing yeah. a shed load of banks, which, you know, properties, because it doesn't need it. Perfect. And did you see the one from um, from Nationwide? I mean, it's allowing all its workforce to work yeah, at home, home yeah. to, which means yeah. that we're going to reduce their, 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 their property footprint, which is great. So what you've got is that these businesses are now will be a lot leaner and therefore you're going to get the operating leverage going forward. So frankly, what historical norms you've had in terms of cost basis could actually be blown out of the water because, you know, there could be a lot, you know, what, you, what you're modelling is, is a lot, um, you know, more conservative than actually what will happen because the, the cost base will be much smaller. What's, mm -hmm. what's quite an interesting point, I thought, for, for Invest, and it comes back to your point that you keep um, mentioning, you know, get involved in investing. Well, why? Okay, because the saying goes now, if you get like nationwide, if you can do your job anywhere, then somebody else equally can your, do your job from anywhere. Yeah. And that means people who are, you know, you traditional white collar skilled workers, etc. If you're not if you're not investing or being in a creative industry, then you're actually quite at risk going to it. But you, investing is a creative industry. It gets you involved and it earns you money that you can do for the whole of your life and therefore yes. will insulate you from any type of reshoring that you might have on your existing job. So it gives you even a, it just should, this pandemic is actually opening the, you know, the eyes of the world. And, and, and investing is a very good way of providing a hedge that it insulates you to a certain extent long term because it gives you an income stream. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I you know, say several times there are many people in many jobs who don't enjoy their jobs. They're just doing their job because it pays them, you know, money. And that's mm. it. And uh, and while they're busy working, you know, they're never going to make any wealth. And uh, so and I say simplistically, there are only two ways to build wealth in, in, in this world, apart from winning the lottery, pretty much. And that's own a successful business or invest in a successful business. And anyone can invest in a successful business if you've got a bit of spare cash. So you're better off spending an hour or two when you come back home from your job that you hate. You know, spend an hour or two learning about investing because, like I say, it doesn't. You can't do it overnight. It's a skill you build up. You get better. You make less mistakes as you as you get more experience. But once does once you've got that skill, it'll stay with you for the rest of your life, and you can build decent wealth. And uh, it's only you and the market. You don't need anyone else. You don't need your boss telling you how many hours you can work. You know, it's you and the market. As long as the market's still there, you can still earn money. And I think uh, you know, everyone should be taught from ground level in school about investing. I think uh, because a genuine is, is a way of you know. Building well, the wealth, pandemic. Building the point is, the pandemic has made it even more critical that you do yeah. it because if if you think you're well, in, no, you know, in fact, when you say that, yeah, I'm just saying to, I was in the, the, the sort of uh, weekly sort of webinar with my ship uh, investment club, and I was saying, what's good about investing is that yeah, algos do it and all that, but there's no one rule fits all with investing. In different businesses, mm. sometimes I'll go on a lot more gut, and other times I'll go on a lot more fundamentals, and sometimes I think that's it's going to work. I just got to feel for it. Or the share price is so low, it's so undervalued, and I feel and I understand. And anyway, and so an AI machine can't sort of do that kind of thing, but you can. They probably can replicate it a little bit, but um, it's still got a human touch to it. You know, where it's a. It's sometimes you'd see people investing in them. They go, "What are you investing in that for?" And then it goes gangbusters. You, no idea why, but you have a feeling for it sometimes, and it, and it yeah. works. You know. Yeah. yeah. I want to pick your brains now. Also, what about small cap fundraising? What's the market like? Because I see one of your stocks, Polarian Imaging, raise twenty five million quid. Well, it, again, it depends who you are. If you're a company like those, there is you know, a quarter of their market cap size, pretty much, with very little discount, seemingly with existing shareholders. Oversubscribed. It's an, yeah, it's not an issue, you know. Uh, and they, they give a nod to shareholders, but they needed that cash, they needed cash to get them beyond the FDA approval date, which is on October the 5th. Uh, and then to commercialization, which they've done. And that was the only, in my mind, the worrying factor, you know, or the, the people were worried about. Now that's removed, it's good. But I mean, like I said, if you've got something that's a potential game changer for that industry, then it's not a problem. You get backers, you know, the, the biggest shareholders took part, all that stuff, uh, directors took part. It's not a problem. If you, again, it's all about the business, isn't it? You've got to go, it always comes back to the business. When people start worrying about certain things like, you know, maybe warrants or uh, things that, that you know, 
peripheral to the actual business. Just think about the business. Like when there's a sell-off yesterday in the markets, I just don't, I said, listen, think about the business you're investing in. Is it going to be in the best position in six, 12 months' time? If it is, don't worry. You can buy shares cheaper right now if you want to. You've got spare cash. But um, you know, there's an, if, it's a, if it's a specific sell-off to your share, then maybe look at it and say, what's going on here? But generally, you know, general sell-offs like that, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's I'm on the same page. Company. If you're a good quality business, the, the, the market is actually really ready for you because the same thing not only would happen to, you know, Polarian last week, but also happened to One Commune two, two days mm. ago because they raised £9 million at a 5% premium to the closing yeah. preceding day's price, oversubscribed. And I know, I know I've, I'm catching up, hopefully, with the CEO sometime next week, um, Adam Smith, I think I remember his name is. And just to remind people, you know, the investors, what it does, it's basically it does its its lead platform is Immuno Insights, which allow which does two things. It allows um, re- effectively next generation diagnostics to be built. So in terms of sort of like being able to um, diagnose people early in terms of cancer, autoimmune, infectious diseases, and and not only to help you can treat these guys earlier. But also you can then, um, once they've actually been diagnosed, you can modulate the, say, if you have, they've got immune suppressant drugs or, or, or your drug regime, such that that person gets personalized medicine by using a, the, the same diagnostics. And also what it does, which is absolutely fabulous, it helps drug companies, biopharma, pr- better predict how their drugs are going to be when they're received by an individual's or, or treated by an individual's immune system, how the individual's immune system will react. So it's helping them all of that drug discovery, which is not only improving the efficacy of their drugs, but also helping them design, which is a massive cost for them, their, um, their clinical trials better so they get better efficacy results. And as I say, they've got a portfolio of fabulous customers like Roche and Genentech and people like that. And just to give you an indication of they announced, I think it was a, a, a study they're doing with, um, I think it was with Roche in uh, rheumatoid arthritis and autoimmune, massive autoimmune, as everybody knows and stuff. And what they're trying to do is decide when, for a particular customer, which drugs are going to work best for that particular patient. And rather than actually just by trial and error, saving the patient a shed load of time, removing its side effects, a huge amount of cost. And, and tailoring it that, that whole treatment regime specifically to the individual. So it's real knockout science. They're still sort of like, you know, um, you know got lots of pipeline opportunities. Um, but, but it just shows you that if you've got a, a really, really cutting edge product, then you can get money quite readily at a good price, at a premium 5% and oversubscribed because investors yeah. want to back it. And as I say, I'm really looking forward to speaking to the, the CEO next week and um, or hopefully ne- in the end next week because it's fabulous technology that, that people sort of, you know, should have a good look at. Yeah, look at, the sh- look at that. From March last year, it's gone from 40 pence to 180 right now. Yeah. Well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, wow. and, then, and the other, and, and that could be. I mean, I, just on valuation, I hate to come back to my spreadsheets again. <laughs> no, no, I, listen, but, it's, it's but then, nice, so it's two part, did, See, it's like a football field or rugby field. Is is fifteen players on the field, all with different styles, and yeah. uh, that's what I'm saying. So you know, you like that side of it. I, I do use spreadsheets now and again, but not as much as as, as that. I, I like a bit of narrative as well. You know, yeah, but, I mean, um, what's the what, what's the market cap currently? On it, it's about um, one hundred and sixteen million. I got there, but I mean, obviously, it's more now. That's ten, ten grand there, isn't it? So, um, yeah, over one hundred and sixteen. Doctor Adam Hill, not Adam Smith, uh, is, is economics, isn't he? But uh, there we are. So they've got Six. seventy million shares following the last price. Okay, seventy million shares, right? Yeah. So effectively, they've spent seventy million quid de- developing the pipeline or the, the, the actual platform. Um, typically, these things go for about four times, so two hundred and eighty million pounds. You then right. sort of like divide by seventy mil, you get four four quid a share. There you go. That's how much you know these things will take. That to again, go. I, I didn't hear that. I was looking. Okay. One hundred twenty-six million market cap there. So say, say it again. So so essentially, they've got they've got seventy million shares. They, they spent seventy million on the platform. This you know, are building this platform, which is you know, a whole bunch of proteins and stuff like that to give them the immuno insights information. It typically goes for a minimum of four times, so four times seventy, 
um, is 280 divide by how many shares in, in you know in circulation 70 mil you get basically four pound a share you know compared to 180 so there's plenty of upside and also a good trick for investors to give people a bit of sort of like extra visibility particularly in healthcare when they partner with people then you can actually have a look at those partners websites now their distributor for their where key product is um, is called BioDesix out in the states, which is which is effectively using their early CDT lung cancer test, which is being trialled in the UK and doing well, etc. But in the states, what they've really in- interesting BioDesix, what they've done is that they've also um, they've joined it up with one of their own tests, which together both tests give a fabulous, I mean, absolute fabulous sensitivity and specificity rate. I mean, I, have, I, I was absolutely flabbergasted because essentially the, the, um, they're now good, they join it up. Their own test has got sensitivity of, of 97%, but the, um, the, the, the early CD test from uh, Oncommune has got a specificity of, of, of 98%. So put them together and you're going to get a test, a dual test, of effectively near 100% for early stage lung cancer. That is breakthrough stuff. And, and, and if this works, if they, if they get, they're doing a validation trial with the, in, over in the States, about 2,000 patients, if that comes out and verifies those stats, I could see this really do, this, that product could, could revolutionize the screening of lung cancer patients around the world, which is by far and away the biggest cancer killer yeah. anywhere. And uh, you know, I'll be very interested to see how see, see what um, what Adams what Sir Adams says. But that it just shows it's all public information. You can pick it off the website. They've got a presentation there, and it tells you the actual numbers. I mean, I could be overplaying it. I don't know because I'm only a layman when it looks at these sort of stuff. But I only picked up the presentation a week or two weeks ago, and the, it, to me, if that is verified in the in the clinical trials which come out later this year. That is a well-balanced, highly accurate um, lung cancer screening test that allows people, you know, to be to be effectively diagnosed with lung cancer at stages one and two, rather than stages four when they rock up into the hospital and effectively they're in they're untreatable and they die within six months. But if you can get them at one stages one and two, the survival rates are just you know much much longer. In fact, you can actually you know hopefully put them into remission because he cut catching it so early so for patients it's massive for treatment costs it's absolutely huge and hopefully for on commune and biodizics that could be a real winner and it explains why biodizics is is absolutely recruiting a lot of sales guys to push this out in the states so it's anyway if people want to have a look at it it's public it's on their website but it's a really good trick learning curve for people in healthcare stocks any partners have a look at, particularly if they're listed, have a look at their investor presentations and see if they're mentioned, because if they're mentioned, then you know it's important. And this one has got about four or five slides associated with it. So biodizics, which are about a billion dollar business, seriously believe this is going to work. And if their numbers are right, then I do as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, one, of the, one of the companies you hold, I think you still hold it, had some news out this week, Equals, didn't they? Yeah, equals. I mean, basically, it was what it was. It was just really launching a new um, LinkedIn product, link card, LinkedIn product for their consumer fair X um, side of the business. But really, what it illustrated was the power of their bank grade technology that you can add on new services fairly quickly into that whole product set to ex- to extend the functionality. And they can do that for themselves, and they can do it for white label partners. And as I say. I, it, this, the shares have fallen off largely again because, you know, you talked about the sort of the, the tech sell off, but also, you know, what's happened in small caps has been a bit brutal across everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but I yeah, yeah. but I can see them releasing some pretty good results, you know, sort of like you know, outlook statements anyway um, at the prelims. I mean, let's be let's be clear about it. We have been in lockdown for three months. And therefore, you know, overseas stuff hasn't worked very well for them. I, I guess I don't know, but I'm guessing it hasn't. Um, and then it'll really just, you know, it'll really drive and what their what their view is. But I could see, given, I mean, you've had the you've had the chief economist of the Bank of England again saying we're going to have an absolute gangbuster time in the second half of 2020. Oh, sorry, 2021. And these ones, the, the, you know, 
um, equals are right, should be right in there with B to B e payments. So I'm, I'm very again, you know, you, you can't buy at the top. You can't buy. You can't buy at the bottom. You can't buy at the. You can't sell at the top. You've just got to accept that if you're a long term investor, if you can make a good bit of money in between, then frankly, that's you know, you're going to do well. And that's how yeah, I but believe. Do, do you know what, though, yeah, but the thing is, it's going to have it's in a range, isn't it? It only needs a breakout. I mean, it's you know, it's, it's, it's trading between what twenty five pence and forty pence. And so it just needs a break out of that 40 pence level, doesn't it? And uh, sooner or later, I suppose, when the economy starts opening back up, which, you know, I'm confident it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to stick to that plan of, of, of Denny, May, you know, May 17. We're, look at it, we're nearly into April already. We're, you know, we're six, 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 seven, eight uh, weeks away. So I think uh, everything will start moving then, you know. Um, People want to get out, don't they? They're ca- yeah. it's, cabin, it's, you know, it's cabin fever they've got. They want to get out there, yeah. enjoy themselves, spend a bit of money. And equals should do really well. I mean, you could easily see a high single-digit GDP print in the UK in the second half. I mean, that just would not be, you know, <laughs> unusual. Really yeah. wouldn't because you've got £60 billion of cash in consumers' pockets that are gonna, is going to be spent according to surveys, and you've got much yeah. more anyway, you know. So it should part do well. Part of me, well. I always try to look at the bright side. I think part of the sell-off as well gives people an opportunity to get in there and it, you know, we, we sort of consolidate from a nice support base because it's been rallying. I remember like a month back on the weekend podcast with mates and uh, Steve, who's probably the least active researcher amongst us all. Uh, the level of his research is, uh, what's the ticker on that one? <laughs> and that's the level of his research. But he said, my, my, my portfolio is hitting all-time highs on a weekly basis back in January. I said, that's a worrying sign. When, you know, you did it, every, yes. everyone, I saw on Twitter, people saying, all-time high, all-time high. When everyone's saying that, it's like the shoe shine boy, isn't it? You know, that's a bit worrying. Now we've had a bit of a sell-off. I feel a bit better about it, you know? I feel like we can rally from this uh, this base now and start to move into, you know, rally towards the opening of the economy uh, because we, we, we rallied too early a little bit, I thought. So um, I would, yeah. I, I, and I think, again, you've highlighted an, an excellent sort of example there. If you're an investor and your, and your portfolio is at all-time high and you frankly don't know why, you haven't got a fundamental reason why it's at an all high tide. You need to do some serious work because you will not be able to repeat that success. It's fluke, mate. That's what it comes down to. It's but do you fluke. know what? I saw it on Twitter. Everyone was saying all time highs. I thought this is a red flag. And we got and a lot of the thing about investing is counterintuitive psychologically. And I said you've got to try and realize fear sometimes is your friend. When everyone's selling off and oh, we're at yeah. lows, that's the time to buy. When everyone's really bullish there and you know, the bull is out and everyone's really bullish, hey, you need some take a bit of profit maybe if you want to if, if you're in good profit maybe wait for the dip and tell it but but again again you, you're getting it the realms of trading which is very hard and uh, not many people can do it and you just check out the stats on most of the big trading sites 75 percent of people lose money like that but um do you know i, I haven't changed I, I knew back then we were in dangerous level when everyone was saying all-time highs but I didn't, I didn't want to particularly sell anything because what's the point? You don't to need it? to, though, do you? I mean, yeah, you don't need it. Yeah. You don't need it. <laughs> well, you're going to spend your money on anyway. Just hold the stocks. No, yeah. exactly. I mean, I, I want, I mean, you know, one of the other guys on the weekend podcast say, I knew I should have sold some. I said, What are you going to do? Jump in and out. You can't, you can't time the market. And so, like, some of the worst days, you know, are followed by some of the best days. So, and, and that yeah. stat, you missed the best 10 days in 10 years. And it, it makes a big difference to your portfolio value. And you can't, you're not that good. No one's that good. No one can spot every day like that and jump in and out. So, and frankly, no and frankly, there. if it doesn't change your quality of life, <laughs> Yeah, why, yeah, do exactly. to, why do you need to sell any shares? Exactly. And if you're holding good businesses and you like them, good. If, if, if you're in a business that's rallied and you didn't like it and it's fluky rally, get out of it. Fair enough. But, I mean, if the business you're in you like, hold on to it, you know? Yeah. yeah. There we are. Anything else? No, no, that's great. I'm looking forward to um, hearing about your new tech pick in EV or uh, renewables in two weeks' time. It's got to come down a little bit. It's just oh, like, no, I, no buy it. Buy it. But have you ever bought something and it's gone up biz- crazily? Because yes, when, with, with scaling in, that's a problem sometimes. Because I always scale in because I think I don't know whether it's going to go a bit lower here. But then sometimes you don't put a lot in, it goes nothing. Oh, no, it's one of the times you hate to stop price going up because uh, but you, part of you likes it, a third of you likes it, but two thirds you think, oh no, you know, because uh, yeah, but um, yeah, but they say it's very hard to judge the bottom. But it's, it's not a problem. It'll come back. All stocks come back a little bit. You know, it's just a bit hot on the chart yeah. you know but uh, all right brilliant yeah. i'll see you cool. in a couple of weeks see you in a couple of weeks justin cheers hello.